Hello everyone and welcome to my session. My name is Frédéric Desbiens, or Fred if you prefer. I'm with the Eclipse Foundation and it is my pleasure today to speak about uh, remote management for uh, Zephyr-based devices with the lightweight M2M protocol. Um, so uh, our agenda for today is uh, fairly straightforward and happy Canada Day, by the way, <laughs> since uh, this is July 1st. So if there are any Canadians uh, listening or rewatching, uh, well, I hope you have a fantastic uh, national, uh, national day. Uh, so our agenda for today is quite simple. Uh, first, I will give some context about lightweight M2M because not necessarily everyone in the IoT or even embedded space is aware of what the protocol is. Then we will discuss uh, how Zephyr specifically supports uh, lightweight M2M. And finally, we'll have a demo, but <laughs> this uh, being uh, completely virtual and I wanted to avoid uh, complications, so to speak. So uh, instead of being a completely live demo, we'll see uh, the various steps uh, of the demo alongside with the screen caps of the results. But I won't be actually running the code right now. Uh, well, uh, to keep things a bit simpler. And uh, I will keep a close look on the Q&A. So there's a Q&A uh, section in the platform. And at the end, it will be my pleasure to answer uh, any question that uh, you would have. And after the session, uh, if you didn't have the time uh, to ask your question or simply want to chat, I will be, be probably hang hanging around the IoT channel in the Slack uh, for the conference. OK, so what is lightweight M2M? Um, well, essentially, Lightweight M2M is a device management protocol that has been built from the ground up for scenarios where you have sensor networks and machine-to-machine -machine environments. And really, it focuses on constrained devices, devices that have, you know, uh, very, very weak uh, CPUs, uh, very little memory, and that need to operate in a low-power uh, environment. Uh, imagine, let's say, a connected building. You put sensors all over the place in the walls and the batteries are supposed to last for five years. So you need uh, to manage those devices, a protocol that will really, really be low power. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, you certainly won't like the experience or you will have to hire a full team of battery change uh, people and you don't want that. I mean, it's not economically feasible. So really, uh, lightweight M2M has been has been built for the ground up to take into account the constraints of IoT. And this is why it's in that context probably a much better uh, alternative than let's say use SNMP or any other data center centric protocol in order to manage the devices. Uh, the nice thing about lightweight M2M is that uh, the people who invented the protocol didn't reinvent the wheel. They built lightweight M2M on the top of another IoT centric protocol that's called CoAP, the constrained application protocol, which means that uh, the basic architecture for both CoAP and lightweight M2M is really very, very close to the one for uh, REST. So, you know, you have verbs, uh, you, publish, you, publish, you send requests, you get responses, that kind of stuff. Uh, the third uh, quality or the third characteristic of Lightweight M2M is that it defines a very extensible resource and data model. So by default, you get uh, a number of properties, but it's built in a way where you can extend it and, and still fit into the specification because essentially there's a formal specification for Lightweight M2M that's owed by uh, OMA Specworks. And so they do uh, the spec uh, work in that, uh, at that organization and you can be a member of that. And on the other hand, uh, you have multiple implementations vying in the market, some of them commercial, some of them open source. All right. Now, uh, before we get, uh, we dig a bit deeper into lightweight M2M, it's really, really important to understand what co-op is about because, uh, well, as I mentioned, lightweight M2M builds upon co-op. So co-op is a specialized co uh, protocol uh, defined in an RFC. So that's RFC uh, 7252. And uh, essentially, uh, 
the greatest characteristic of co-op is that it's it's really got a minimal overhead, okay? Uh, essentially, any device that supports UDP or something equivalent to UDP, uh, UDP like you could, you could run it over SMS, for example, will be able to support co-op. Uh, the typical header for a co-op frame uh, is... Uh, around 100, uh, you know, 100 bytes. So that's uh, very, very small compared to uh, many other protocols uh, that you can find in the typical data center. And the nice thing about Coop is that it can be used on the same, uh, you know, on a, on a unique or a centralized uh, constraint network. So low power network in the field, let's say you have a bunch of sensors in a, in a factory, that kind of stuff, but it can be connected uh, over the general internet as well. And uh, you can even join uh, separate constraint networks together in order to provide uh, a connected distributed environment. So co-op by design is very close to HTTP. As I mentioned, it uses the REST model with the get, put, post, and delete verbs. It's got URIs, response codes, MIME types. Uh, but uh, one important thing in co-op is really that it leverages a lot uh, multicast. For example, if you have to do device discovery, you will send the multicast packet, and then you will uh, see uh, whatever, whatever device on the network will uh, respond to that, uh, to that packet. So Co-op is really important in the context of uh, lightweight M2M. And so when we look at the protocol stack for co-op, obviously you have some sort of physical channel, can be Ethernet, can be wireless, whatever. And then on the top of that, the typical protocols, so uh, Bluetooth, uh, low energy, or a, a personal area network, so that you know the 802.15.4 family of, uh, of protocols there, uh, which includes uh, Zigbee, which includes uh, six low pan. In this case, uh, we see it in the in the stack. Uh, so there are various flavors of that, but all of them tie back to the 802.15.4 uh, specification. And then um, on the top of that, you have uh, IPv4, IPv6 uh, that are supported. UDP uh, with uh, optional DTLS, uh, which is uh, uh, an adaptation of TLS uh, to the, the, the embedded space. Uh, and after that, well, co-op is message oriented. So you've got messages, requests, responses, and your applications on the top. And all of that uh, is, uh, is really, and fairly in a, in a programmer's perspective, really, really simple to use. Now, how does that fit in the typical lightweight M2M environment? Well, um, this is uh, the official diagram that they put in, in the various documents at OMA Specworks to describe the lightweight M2M protocol stack. And you see the central place of co-op um, in, uh, in that diagram. Uh, the, the interesting thing in this diagram is that it really highlights the flexibility of lightweight M2M. Yes, uh, running over UDP, running using uh, IPv6, using uh, 6 low pan and stuff like that is a typical use case. But you can run this, you know, using SMS. Uh, you can obviously run this over attended protocols such as uh, LoRaWAN. So there are many, many possibilities there. And I think that's certainly one of the strengths of Lightweight F2M, the, the fact that it uh, lends itself to a variety of deployments uh, without losing any, any feature, whatever deployment uh, topology or, or uh, configuration you would choose. Okay. Uh, now, what are the features of Lightweight M2M? What, did, what does it give to you? Um, the first one is bootstrapping, and that one is really critical if you are thinking about mass producing devices in the sense that, or not even mass uh, producing, but even mass deploying uh, devices inside an organization if you, if you design and, and uh, build the devices yourself. Uh, why is that? Uh, the bootstrapping mechanism means you can have a bootstrap server on the network where essentially at the factory or when you are building the device, you will put by default some uh, PKI, some security certificates for DTLS, that kind of stuff. But those are, you know, the factory provided ones. They are just a transient artifact that will enable the device to connect to a bootstrap server that will recognize the credentials. And once this 
bootstrapping processes over the bootstrap server essentially will assign you know a proper ip address a proper uh, digital certificate etc to the device and then it will be actually uh, be configured and connect to the real production network so to speak and that's a very very uh, well defined area in the protocol and that's really useful because if you build something from the ground up uh, using uh, an alternate protocol, you won't necessarily have those bootstrapping mechanisms. And uh, well, believe me, rotating credentials by hand or devising your own method to do that uh, f when you are designing, uh, you know, a, a, a turnkey IoT solution is really a pain. So the fact that Lightweight M2M provides that, it's certainly a big advantage. Then uh, Lightweight M2M, uh, you know, takes care of device configuration. So essentially, uh, you know, it, it provides the primitives for you to retrieve and modify uh, devices uh, con uh, configuration. And uh, certainly, uh, once again, the fact that this is standardized is, um, you know, a big productivity gain for developers when uh, leveraging the protocol. Another intriguing feature in Lightweight M2M is the fact that it will support firmware updates. So essentially, the way this would work, let's say in a Zephyr context, so you build your executable, you put it on an HTTP server somewhere, or maybe you use uh, some, uh, some uh, software update management platform like uh, we've got a nice one at the Eclipse Foundation that's called Eclipse Hogbit. So you could use Hogbit uh, to perform that. But essentially, once the new firmware binary is available over HTTP somewhere, then you can initiate a software or firmware update on the device using Lightweight M2M. So essentially, you flag the device for update and provide the URL to the, to the new uh, firmware. Uh, file on your HTTP server, and then you start the update. So this means that the device will obviously download the new firmware, replace it in per, in uh, persistent memory, and then reboot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, all of that is taken care of in in the, at the protocol level. So once again, this is really really uh, handy. Obviously, uh, you still need to plan accordingly. I mean, if you want to support uh, firmware updates like that, please ensure that you have. Uh, you know, enough persistent storage on the device to be able to do this. Uh, so if you if you calculate things too tight, you won't unfortunately be able to do that. And then um, Lightweight M2M has everything you need in order to manage faults or manage uh, errors, um, manage the configuration and control of um, not only the device, but the applications running underneath. And it's got reporting features as well in the sense that you can easily uh, query any of the properties defined by the device or uh, even use the observe mechanism. That's a part of co-op and Lightweight M2M exposes that where essentially, um, you know, uh, some, some server can be an observer, so to speak, of the device. Which me and 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 when I say of the device, it's a rather of a specific property on the device. Let's say you have a temperature sensor and you expose that, then um, you know the server can register to watch that specific temperature value, and then when the value changes, the device will send to observers a message with the new value. Uh, this is really handy, and this enables you uh, to, to tweak your code to your use case because uh, maybe, well, if you are monitoring temperature in uh, rooms, for example, inside the digital, uh, digital building, uh, maybe it's not meaningful for you if, you know, the, the, the temperature just goes up by, you know, one, one tenth of a degree. Maybe you want uh, the change to be reported if 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 it's five tenths. You know, you you are at 23 uh, Celsius and then you go up to 23.5, for example. So in the way you write the code, you can manage when those notifications are sent, which means you can really optimize okay uh, the code for your application to the power profile of your device to the power profile of your application. And um, lightweight M2M means it's really uh, easy to tailor your application to scenarios like that. All right. 
So now we have a fairly good idea of, at a high level, what a lightweight M2M can do. Let's now focus on how it's implemented in the Zephyr RTOS. Um, so uh, this is a bit small on the slide. So I already updated the deck to uh, the conferencing tool so you can retrieve the PDF from there. But essentially, uh, if you look a bit, uh, if you squint a bit, you will see that there are two little circles, uh, red circles on the diagram. Uh, that I took in the Zephyr documentation. Um, and one is uh, the six low pen, larger, uh, you know, lighter blue uh, rectangle. So you see 15.4 uh, support, BLE, and on the top, you see six low pen. So six low pen is a way to, uh, it's, it's a Bluetooth profile, essentially, uh, that uh, you can use in order to run IPv6 offer Bluetooth low energy. Okay, and then uh, you see lightweight M2M at, uh, at the top in the application services right besides MQTT and co-op. Uh, so uh, obviously the, the, the diagram there cannot show the, the, the relationship between co-op and lightweight M2M, but in Zephyr, like in everything else, uh, lightweight M2M leverages the, the co-op protocol, the co-op implementation. And there are in the in the GitHub for Zephyr, there are two very relevant samples uh, for the general use of a six low pan and then the lightweight M2M client. So the IPSP um, sample really focuses on just running six low pan. So it's a good way to troubleshoot an environment, troubleshoot your, your hardware, that kind of stuff, just to ensure that you can establish an IPv6 connection over Bluetooth low energy. So I always recommend people to try that one out first and ensure that everything works at that level. And after that, there's the pure lightweight M2M client. Uh, you can run that using Q QMU, okay, uh, using emulation, or you can uh, use an actual board. In my case, my demo is relying on the real board. And so I will uh, give the details of the hardware a bit, uh, a bit later. And obviously, uh, if you want to really test this, you need and not only the lightweight M2M sample client application on the Zephyr side, but also a lightweight M2M server. And fortunately, we've got a free and open source one to offer there. All right. And that server is uh, Eclipse Lesion. So um, Lesion, as its core, is really a Java library for implementing lightweight M2M clients and servers. So it's not a full-blown server, but it provides demo, uh, a demo server for lightweight M2M and also a demo bootstrap server implementing, you know, the various primitives related to, to that. So you can very easily uh, take advantage of those demo servers in Lesion to get started with lightweight M2M on the server side. And obviously there are many implementations like um, you know, Lesion is used uh, by, uh, by Bosch and other members of Eclipse IoT uh, in commercial products. And, uh, well, uh, I must say that uh, even the Zephyr documentation points you to Lesion when the time comes to, to leverage a lightweight M2M server. So it's certainly widely used and uh, well appreciated in the community. Lesion is very simple. It's not using any third-party frameworks. It has few dependencies. And it provides nifty web UIs, and you will see a few screenshots later um, for disc, uh, device discovery, testing, that kind of stuff. And even, let's say, the firmware update scenario I described you, you can totally do that using the web, uh, the web UI in Lesion, granted that you have access to some, uh, some HTTP server to deploy the new firmware file somewhere. Uh, you build it using Maven install, so it's really, really easy to, to deploy in that uh, perspective if you start from uh, the source code. And it's leveraging our co-op implementation at the Eclipse Foundation that's called Eclipse Californium. And Californium is a very mature, well-supported, it comes from Bosch, uh, implementation of co-op. And so, uh, well, plenty of good stuff, as you can see, going on at Eclipse. Okay. Now I will give you some code. The only warning I would give you, I took code out of the Zephyr demo there. And to fit it on the slides, I, I made some cuts. You know, I removed some of the ifs, I removed the comments, I removed everything so that you can, uh, you can have a view. So please refer to the full sample, uh, and I put the link earlier in the deck 
uh, if you want to have a look at this. But uh, for illustration purposes, you've got some code uh, in this uh, presentation. So first, the includes. Um, you will see that uh, the includes for typical lightweight M2M application are, are fairly standard. Obviously, you've got the base uh, Zephyr.h. And in this case, the sample you know, reads hardware information. It, it uh, configures stuff over GPIO. It relies on some sensors. So it's using the includes for that. But lightweight M2M itself is very simple, just a plain uh, header file uh, in net uh, slash uh, lightweight M uh, M2M and nothing more than that. And that speaks to the great uh, simplicity and great design in Zephyr that it's so simple to just add support for the protocol uh, by adding so few, so few includes, so few headers. Uh, looking at the typical main for a sample application, uh, we'll see here there's a struct uh, that's defined that contains client information. And essentially, uh, you have to do some setup and, and put you know, uh, value, values in a structured way for, for uh, future use. Um, and then um, after some initialization, you call the lightweight M2M RD client start uh, function. Uh, by passing this client structure and then some other information to get the actual uh, lightweight M2M stack initialized and start. Um, it's as simple as that. Uh, now, um, one important thing is uh, that, um, you know, uh, as I, as I mentioned before, this, this main is really streamlined. I removed some of the code, so please have uh, the, I look at the full sample for uh, the full code. A typical uh, initialization function here, uh, so lightweight M2M setup here, so that's the one that we were calling at the very top of the main here. And essentially what it does, you see, it assigns values to a number of uh, lightweight M2M resources. And all of that, the fact that it's 300301, et cetera, all of that are, are, all of those standard values are defined in the lightweight M2M, um, lightweight M2M specification. So you're not inventing that, but obviously since the data model is extensible, you, are, you can add your own in a structured way as defined in the spec. Uh, the other thing that you do in a typical setup function will be not only to register those values, but to register some callbacks as well. So when you have specific events happening, you want to process them. So you register the callbacks and then uh, the callbacks will execute whatever, whatever logic you want to at uh, runtime. Um, this is an example of one of those uh, callbacks. So this is a general uh, callback for client events uh, that has been registered in a previous uh, method. And in this case, in the sample app, is just a one giant switch. And all it does is to log the fact that, let's say, we have, uh, we have a registration failure for us as a lightweight M2M client or we have a registration success and that kind of stuff. But obviously you could put some uh, business logic there uh, in order to do specific things when registration works or anything like that. So uh, once again, uh, the, 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 the protocol is very clear and clean there in the sense that it's really about defining values, defining callbacks and decide what you want to want at, uh, what you want to do at runtime. All right, now about uh, the little demo that I built to uh, support this uh, specification. Uh, essentially, what I did is uh, on one side to run my Zephyr uh, application, I used an Adafruit uh, Feather, uh, and this is the RF52 model. So essentially, it's got a small uh, Cortex-M4 at 64 megahertz, uh, some, uh, some storage, but not too much. And it's got a built-in uh, USB serial converter, so you just plug it in, and then you can uh, you can observe whatever is happening on the on the console. And then uh, it's got uh, Bluetooth low-energy radio built-in. And on the other side, I just 
use you know uh, random Raspberry Pi I had uh, lying around. In this case, a model B plus. You could use probably any any uh, model there. Really, uh, it was running uh, Raspbian, the latest version. Um, and uh, once again, we've got Bluetooth support in there. So essentially, uh, what we had to do uh, essentially was to compile. You know, the demo code, deploy that on our uh, little Adafruit feather. And then on the other side, uh, just ensure that uh, 6 low pan, IPv6, all of that was configured properly on the Raspberry Pi. And then uh, we are running Lashen on uh, the Raspberry Pi. So we need to bring that up. And uh, that's what I will illustrate uh, in the next few slides. So uh, all of the code here, if you download the PDF, should be cut and uh, you should be able to cut and paste uh, paste it without any any problems. And I put uh, you know little screenshots there of the output, so you have an idea of uh, what's happening when you type those comments. Uh, so to deploy the Zephyr Lightweight M2M demo is uh, really straightforward. It's just if you want to use it over uh, Bluetooth you have to ensure that you've got the proper configuration overlay. Uh, the sample comes with overlays for uh, several things, but uh, in this case, there's one specifically for Bluetooth, another one for DTLS. So in this case, I just using uh, the, the, the Bluetooth one. And then we do West Flash in order to deploy. So my other fruit fetter uh, needed uh, a, little, uh, a little flasher. Uh, so I'm using the jailing from from Segerd in this case, and then we use Minicom in order to connect to our uh, board to see whatever is happening. So when you do that, you have the output that you see on the right, and you see that the application is starting and the last message wait, waiting interface uh, to to be up. So the network is, um, you know. Uh, getting up, and uh, unless unless we assign an IP address uh, to the device, uh, it won't it won't go further than that. So that's what we do as a second step, essentially, uh, establish the Bluetooth connection, and then um, essentially uh, ensure that we we uh, associate a, a, in this case a static IP IPv6 address to it. So in order to do that, the first set of instructions you do, uh, you need to ensure that six low pan is uh, active uh, in your Linux kernel. So uh, you do a mod, mod probe on Bluetooth six low pan uh, in order to activate that. And then uh, echo one uh, six low pan uh, enable. So with that, uh, everything kernel wise is okay. The next step, uh, you need to retrieve uh, the, 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 the Bluetooth or the, the Bluetooth ID of uh, the device. So HCI tool uh, is what you use for that. So when you type that command, you will get the output in the first screenshot uh, at the top here. And you see that, okay, there are many unknown devices. Uh, so that's my phones and random stuff. I mean, so much Bluetooth stuff in my home. It's... Uh, it's a testament to the fact that I work in IT, I guess. Uh, so I retrieved, you, you, we see there's only one, you know, lightweight M2M IPSP node. So that's the uh, identifier that has been uh, allocated to my device. So I retrieved that in the identifier and then I run the echo connect command that you see here in the second part uh, of, uh, of the slide. So we pass that, uh, we do that echo to six low pan control and we use IP to assign a specific static IP address and that becomes the BT0 interface when you type ifconfig, for example. And when you do ping six on that specific address, you will see, as you see in the second screenshot, that you can you can ping uh, the device. So, with that, we have the insurance that we are at, uh, we have established properly the connection over six low pan and uh, assign uh, you know assign a proper IP address. All right. Now, at this point, we just have the, 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 the lightweight M2M sample running on our board. So the next step is to start our lightweight M2M server. Uh, oh, and by the way, I, I added 
additional screenshots. When you assign the IPv6 address to the board, you will see additional output coming up, and you will see that there will be registration uh, registration timeout. So that's the screenshot on the right of the slide. So you see it in bold, registration timeout. This is because we don't have a lightweight M2M server running at that point. So we need to bring Leshen up in order to do that. And that's our step number three. So you can get the latest nightly build uh, of the Leshen demo server by just doing this little wget. Okay, and it's uh, it's just a few megabytes, so it should be over fairly quickly. And then uh, you just start the jar you just downloaded. So if you have uh, if you have a JDK uh, version eight and up, this would work uh, perfectly fine. Uh, just ensure that you set the 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 configuration parameter to prefer IPv6 addresses since um, Sexlopan uses IPv6. So this will ensure that uh, uh, Leshen won't waste its time uh, listening on uh, IPv4. And you get, once Leshen is uh, running, you get the output that you see in the screenshot. When this happens, you can connect to uh, to the Leshen demo server. So you just use the IP address and, and port. Uh, and those, those things, by the way, when you start Leshen are configurable. So by default, it will use ATAT. If that port is uh, already used in your environment, then uh, obviously uh, this, uh, this will... Uh, I want to say that uh, you, 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 can, you can reassign Lashen to use another port without any problem, okay? Uh, and uh, if you have multiple network cards in your environment, that's the same. You can uh, assign it to a specific uh, network interface or that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really flexible. It's got a whole, whole slew of options you can pass to it in order to configure it the proper way. But in this case, I use the defaults. So I connected to my little uh, Raspberry Pi on port 8080, and, I get, and I've got the screenshot on the left. So this is the list of devices that are registered on the lightweight M2M server. So you see my little Adafruit feather there. And when you click on it, you get the screenshot on the right. So it will enumerate uh, the various things that are available you know, on the device. And you see uh, that most of those values, you can do an observe, you can do a read, you can do a write, okay? So you can dynamically modify uh, the values for those configuration parameters or uh, device parameters. And depending on what hardware support uh, you have on the on the board, you can, obviously uh, expose those uh, sensors and those uh, hardware features through lightweight M2M. Uh, so in the sample uh, that's provided with Zephyr, uh, you have support for some lights, uh, temperature sensor, that kind of stuff built in. So if the board exposes that, then you can manipulate them straight from the interface. And the interface on the left is also the one used uh, to deploy firmware updates. So once again, uh, this is uh, something that we could, uh, we could have done. So um, that's what Leshen looks like. And at that point, you have a working, uh, working environment and you can start building your, uh, you know, fine tuning your lightweight M2M application, uh, implement uh, support for whatever hardware you want to support, that kind of stuff. Uh, and Leshen will pick up whatever, whatever you code uh, you know, in the in your Zephyr application, and expose and register properly in the lightweight M2M stack. So it's it's that easy to work with. Now, Leshen is only part of what we have in Eclipse IoT. So uh, I already spoke about uh, Eclipse California, our co-op uh, implementation. And uh, I also evoked uh, Eclipse Hogbit, which is uh, uh, an enterprise-grade solution to deploy software updates. Uh, so in this case, uh, when you consider everything that we've got uh, in Eclipse IoT at this point in time, but those numbers are you know, always outdated, but uh, at least they were good as of uh, last week, so end of June 2020, 
uh, we've got uh, more than 8 million lines of code in the 45 projects that we host specifically in Eclipse IoT. Uh, more than 350 contributors, 42 member organizations, and uh, in fact, 43. We had a new member last week, uh, so we are growing all the time there. And that's just the Eclipse IoT community. The Eclipse Foundation as a whole has uh, 375 or even 400 projects at this point in time. So just in the IoT space, we've got 45. And then uh, when you look at the membership we've got in our IoT working group, you see our strategic members, Bosch, Eurotech, and Red Hat, and you see a who's who of the names in IT. Really, we have all sorts of players, little startups, uh, huge multinationals, and we've got the Linux Foundation. And this is something I would like to em emphasize here today, the fact that the Linux Foundation is a member of the Eclipse Foundation. The Eclipse Foundation is a member of the Linux Foundation and specifically of the Zephyr project. We don't have an Arthos of our own and we are proud to throw our support behind Zephyr and other open source RTOSs. But I must say Zephyr is certainly uh, one, of the, one of the best, if not the best. Uh, so we work very closely with the Linux Foundation and we are happy to be a part of this uh, ecosystem. Now, my call to action at the end of this presentation would be for you to really become an Eclipse member, to join our IoT working group and help us build the future of open source IoT, and to contribute to the various IoT projects that we have, or even if you have technology that you want to open source, obviously we are open to that uh, as well. Okay, uh, now, uh, if you have questions, and there are some questions, I will uh, look at them. Please continue to add them to the Q&A, and I will get through them uh, as they come. Uh, if you want to keep in touch, I'm on Twitter as Blueberry Coder, and you can visit our website on iotecleps.org. So thank you so much for listening, and now I will have a look at whatever questions are in the pipeline. So Pulkit is asking, does Lightweight M2M have mesh support available? This is not something that I tested personally. I can be wrong there, uh, So, uh, but uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, I would expect this uh, to, to, to work uh, properly. I mean, as, as long as whatever, whatever mesh uh, you, you are using is able to assign IPv6 addresses, the little, the little scenario that I just described should be, should be able uh, to work. Obviously, uh, mesh environments uh, may mean that uh, you will consume a bit more power, so you need to be careful about that. Then uh, Robert is asking, are there other ways to connect the six low pan device over Bluetooth besides writing to the syskernel debug file? Do regular Bluetooth tools support it? I would expect this to work, but I must say I'm no Bluetooth specialist. Um, but this is uh, this is something I will I will try to dig a bit in. So maybe I will I will put some uh, something uh, somewhere in the in the Slack channel uh, if I if I get a more definitive answer there. Uh, obviously, what I did in my demo was just to illustrate how things work at a basic level. But I would expect whatever whatever typical Bluetooth tool you use to be absolutely working, uh, as long as your kernel has the six low pan support baked in and you that that you activate obviously that uh, that module either explicitly or by default by putting that uh, in, in the proper configuration file. The third question in the Q&A is from Andreas. And Andreas is asking, assuming I'm building a product for an on-premise solution, how does the client discover the server? Well, that's the thing. Uh, the client doesn't discover the server. Uh, what the client will do is to broadcast its, its presence. Uh, because essentially, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, co-op and lightweight M2M are big on broadcast. So essentially, you send a broadcast packet and whatever server is there will accept the registration, uh, the registration packet and essential, or the registration uh, message and then uh, will uh, we'll process that. So if I go a bit earlier in, in my slides, so we see that process happening in the in the screenshot on the right. Uh, you see a registration timeout, registration failure, 
and then uh, you know the, the the lightweight M2M client is simply sending those registration messages all the time until a server will pick up the registration and send an acknowledgement uh, message in return. Okay, so when essentially my election um, server came up, we can see lower in the output that the message has been, um, has been, uh, you know, the registration message has been uh, received and uh, the acknowledgement has been uh, sent. And we see uh, about in the middle of the output that registration is complete. So that how, that's how it works. And that's one of the strengths of uh, lightweight M2M. You don't need to know in advance the IP address for the server. Uh, you just, you know, start the client. If there's a bootstrap, if you want to use bootstrap, you need the bootstrap server to be available. So, uh, you know, the, the, the client will send a bootstrap message until a bootstrap server picks up. The bootstrap server, when it picks up, will send back all uh, the, the required information. And then after that, uh, the, the, the device will register against, uh, you know, the, the, the proper lightweight M2M server. So it's really great lightweight M2M as a solution for environments where the environment is unpredictable because you don't have in advance to know the IP addresses for the servers and all of that. And using DTLS, you can make sure, you know, using standard, uh, standard encryption that uh, the data flows will be safe from man in the middle attacks and stuff like that. All right. I don't see any, any uh, further questions um, in the Q and A. So uh, if you have further questions, please add them now and uh, I will try to answer them. Uh, or otherwise, as I say, I will probably hang out in the Slack for the conference uh, after this uh, this session ends. So uh, the last thing I would like to say is thank you so much for attending my presentation today. I really appreciate uh, your presence. I appreciate the questions that you asked. I hope this was useful. And uh, please visit us at iotecleps.org and leverage uh, the open source components that we've got there. Uh, many of them uh, are, uh, you know, server side implementations that you can deploy in any cloud or on Kubernetes or on premises. You do whatever you want to do. And we've got some tools that are useful, obviously, in embedded development, um, you know, uh, uh, such as, uh, so, uh, so, such as, uh, well, in this case, uh, uh, lightweight M2M. Uh, I've got additional questions there. Uh, one uh, is, I missed how to install it on the device, uh, Feather. Could you repeat? Uh, yes, I can repeat that. So it's fairly straightforward. So essentially, uh, suppose that you have a Linux machine, you install the lightweight M2M, uh, not lightweight M2M, but the, the Zephyr SDK. Uh, so that's really the simplest way to, to set up the tool chain and all of that. So once the Zephyr SDK is there, uh, you, have, uh, you have to clone the GitHub uh, repo for uh, the Zephyr code base. And uh, going to, to the... the the root folder of that, you type the command here, west build, you have to specify your board. Uh, the code is in samples net lightweight M2M client and you pass the fact that you use the Bluetooth overlay to configure Bluetooth. After that, you just flash, once config, comp compilation is over, you just flash your board using west and then you can, you can use Minicom or any other uh, terminal application to connect over the virtual uh, terminal over USB that you get in order to, to, to access uh, the output. And that's about it. So uh, it's very, very simple to deploy, uh, you know, the application on, uh, on the device. Okay. If there are no further questions, once again, thank you so much. Once again, happy Canada Day. And uh, I'm looking forward to interact with you during the rest of the conference over Slack. If not, there's always Twitter. I'm Blueberry Coder uh, over there, as you can see uh, on the last of my slides. So don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, always happy to strike a conversation. So once again, thank you. And I wish you a nice rest of the conference to everyone.